glutamate model of, of schizophrenia is based on the observation that A, ketamine produces the full range of symptoms, B, amphetamine produces psychotic symptoms, C, elevated cytokine levels in utero are a risk factor, and D, all of the above. Boy, <laughs> I, I guess I don't really need to give the talk. <laughs> In the next hour, covering uh, psychotic disorders with, with an emphasis on schizophrenia, although we will talk briefly about other psychotic disorders. Here are my disclosures. So the objectives for my talk will be, first we're going to cover the DSM criteria for schizophrenia, then talk about the risk factors, including genetics, uh, the course and prognosis, and then we'll end with uh, etiologic models, neurodegenerative, neurodevelopmental, and biochemical models. So this is a lot of material. I will go as quickly as I can, but just uh, rest assured that all the information is in your syllabus. So to start, just make sure we're all on the same page. I uh, to define psychosis. So, so psychosis uh, is just an impairment in reality testing, which can be caused by a number of different deficits in, in uh, mental processing. So primarily delusions, which again are the uh, fixed false beliefs that patients hold despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, uh, hallucinations, you know, which can occur in any modality, you know, perceptions in the absence of any actual environmental stimulus, uh, and then disorganization. And so we'll be talking about these again. But these are the three psychotic s symptom categories, all of which can cause a person to lose reality testing. Our current concept of schizophrenia really dates back to uh, Kreplin, you know, a, a German neurologist who uh, coined the term dementia pre in looking in, uh, in hospitals in which patients were uh, impaired in various ways, he noticed one group of patients who were psychotic, who had continuous illness and a sort of steady deteriorating course in the absence of mood components. So Kreplin identified these patients as uh, dementia precox, and, and the current DSM concept of schizophrenia is very true to Kreplin's original observations. Uh, Bloiler then followed with adding sort of another uh, element to it, and, and he, he's famous for the four A's, which conveniently translate from the German uh, into autism, ambivalence, uh, loose associations, and flat affect. Um, and so Kreplin sort of added what we would now consider more the uh, negative symptoms and the, the cognitive component of schizophrenia. And, and our, our view today is, is pretty much a combination of these two, uh, these two early views. So uh, the current definition of schizophrenia, so this is DSM-4-TR, um, is first, a uh, patient has to fulfill the active phase. And the active phase of the illness, um, which we'll, I'll show you another slide sort of delineating this, is a psychotic or negative symptoms for at least one month. Um, this is one month if not treated. If a patient presents with active phase and successfully responds, uh, in less than four weeks, they can still meet the criteria. Functioning below their highest expected level, and this may be difficult in terms of the stage of life in which a patient develops the illness, and sometimes it's easiest then in looking over their history to compare their life's trajectory to siblings or other people in terms of what you would expect given their, their background. Um, and finally, duration of the illness, at least six months. So we don't make the diagnosis until a person has been ill or impaired for six months. And this, the clock starts at the time when their functioning level declines, not when the psychotic symptoms occur. So if a patient has had a prodrome, say, dropped out of school, has become withdrawn, has become odd, that's really the start for this six-month period as opposed to when the actual uh, full psychotic symptoms emerge. So first to define the active phase, uh, the active phase requires two psychotic or negative uh, symptoms. So um, either the presence of delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, or, or grossly disorganized uh, or catatonic behavior, or negative symptoms. So two of those. The one exception being that certain forms of delusions and hallucinations are considered so classic, uh, the presence of only one of those uh, meets the criteria. So um, that would be either bizarre delusions, but biz bizarre delusion is something like a patient believes his heart has been surgically removed and replaced with a beer can, you know, something that's completely not feasible, as opposed to a non-bizarre delusion. It's the belief that, say, the CIA is monitoring you, that, that your, your wife is unfaithful, things that uh, are, are quite plausible. Or, um, <laughs> I guess, yeah, speak, speak for yourself, right? Yeah. Um, 
or uh, hallucinations, you know, uh, voices which are either more than one voice engaged in a conversation or voices with running commentary on the person's thoughts or behavior. So either of those uh, psychotic symptoms are classic enough that, that uh, you don't need a second uh, psychotic symptom. So subtypes of schizophrenia, it, it's unclear how valid these subtypes are. Uh, there's some evidence they may change over time. Probably paranoid subtype is the most valid and the most clinically relevant. Uh, but the subtypes include paranoid, uh, which does not always have to involve paranoia, interestingly, but it, it's the subtype that only has psychotic symptoms, you know, hallucinations and delusions without cognitive deficits and disorganization or negative symptoms. Uh, disorganized in both disorganization of speech and behavior, uh, often with inappropriate affect. Catatonic, uh, again, realizing that catatonia occurs in illnesses other than schizophrenia, but this is a subtype of schizophrenia as well, undifferentiated um, or residual when patients are no longer psychotic. The exclusionary criteria are just very, very important. If one were to, say, take a, a board uh, examination, you, you really think of schizophrenia in terms of a diagnosis of exclusion, particularly excluding organic etiologies, but also other uh, more benign etiologies, particularly, say, uh, affective uh, psychoses. So uh, I'm going to start with just sort of the overall uh, sort of more simplistic way to think about this, and then I'll give more information, particularly about schizoaffective disorder. You want to exclude mood disorders or psychotic mood disorders. First is schizoaffective disorder. And schizoaffective disorder, which again, I'll show you the sort of the fine print, you know, in terms of diagnosis, but basically it means means that a mood disorder, you know, mania or depression is prominent, and prominent generally means it occurs during a substantial portion of the illness, although that's not further defined. And the patient has periods uh, of at least two weeks when they are uh, psychotic, even when their mood is euthymic. So a little bit complicated, but they're psychotic during, uh, they, they have psychosis, plus they have uh, substantial m episodes of m mood disorder, but the important differentiation is they are also psychotic when they're euthymic. Then bipolar disorder, again, which you'll hear more about, uh, but, but again, is psychosis only during manic or depressive phases, and then psychotic depression. Very important not to miss these because treatments are, are different for mood uh, disorders than for schizophrenia per se. Again, for an examination, it's very important that you consider organic etiologies and, and really sort of start there with your, your, if you're to present a differential diagnosis. Most common organic etiologies of uh, disorders that appear to be schizophrenia are substance abuse. Um, so always think in terms of substance abuse. Uh, neurologic disorders, including seizure disorder, um, and uh, be very careful about uh, deliria. So uh, always make sure that uh, the psychosis occurs in a relatively uh, clear sensorium and that the person is not actually delirious. This is sort of the fine print for schizoaffective disorder. It's essentially what I just described, but if those of you who want to study at home, this is the, the sort of the, uh, the actual text uh, from DSM. Again, it's, it's what I just described, and this, this is a sort of more about schizoaffective disorder. I find schizoaffective disorder causes enough sort of consternation among people studying for the boards. I want to give you uh, the, the sort of full definition. Um, other related uh, diagnoses, so if a patient essentially appears to have schizophrenia but has not met the full six-month criterion, then we call it uh, schizo schizophreniform disorder. So if it's not yet uh, reached the full six months, uh, but they have been ill at least for a month. Um, if a psychosis that less lasts less than a month, uh, there's sort of this historic diagnosis of brief reactive psychosis. The causal relationship to a traumatic event is, is no longer really considered part of the definition or necessarily valid. Uh, schizotypal personality basically means uh, the s active phase symptoms, you know, s symptoms of psychosis, uh, do not quite re reach the threshold of psychosis. So rather than a delusion, people may have idiosyncratic or odd beliefs. Or rather than a full-fledged thought disorder, they may just have sort of an odd uh, manner of expressing themselves. Schizotypal personality is really sort of an attenuated form of schizophrenia. And the, the schizophrenia prodrome, in fact, can look like schizotypal personality. Uh, and then finally, the delusional disorders. These are psychotic disorders that only have 
the psychotic symptoms, you know, meaning delusions without any of the other symptoms of schizophrenia, generally without deterioration in f functioning. Delusions are non-bizarre. They, they are plausible delusions. Um, and in fact, there are five specific uh, forms of delusional disorder. 